recording. Uh, good evening to everyone and welcome to the second program of Emily Dickinson Museum's 2024 Phosphorescence Contemporary Poetry Series. Now in its fourth year, this series brings you some of the most exciting contemporary poets we know who have caught the spark of Emily Dickinson's own phosphorescent light. We enjoyed bringing you the work last month of our guest poets, Rich Mickelson, Ivy Schweitzer, and Al Salihi, and we are thrilled to continue this series with all the poets in the 2024 lineup. My name is Elizabeth Bradley, and I'm the Education Programs Manager at the Emily Dickinson Museum. And before I begin um, introducing tonight's poets, I have just a few words of Zoom housekeeping for you. First of all, uh, we encourage you to use the chat feature in your Zoom app to share affirmations and words of encouragement for our poets tonight. They won't see your comments until after the programs, but we promise to share this record of our time together with them, and they always enjoy reading it. Uh, tonight's readings will be followed by a Q&A, and I will be looking for your questions in the typed Q&A feature so that I can pose them for tonight's poets. You can find this Q&A feature in your Zoom toolbar, and you may place questions there at any time during the program. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our poets this evening. Julian Strong is the author of four, book, four books, um, including poetry collections, The Mouth of Earth, and Tour of the Breath Gallery. Their poetry has appeared in The Nation, Poetry, The Southern Review, the Sun, River Styx, and many other journals. A recipient of grants from the Sustainable Arts Foundation and Connecticut Arts Council, they teach creative writing at Central Connecticut State University and lived in Hamden, Connecticut. Benjamin S. Grisberg is the author of four books of poetry, including My Husband Wood, winner of the 2021 Connecticut Book Award, and Sweet Poor Orchard, winner of the Tampa Review Prize and a Lambda Literary Award. He also wrote the novel, The Spring Before Obergefell, winner of the 2023 AWP Award Series, James Allen McPherson Prize. He directs the creative writing program at the University of Hartford. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight. We're really excited. And uh, Julian, will you care to kick us off? I will. Thank you, Elizabeth. So, Ben Grossberg and I have known each other for about 12 years, and we've been friends and, um, and poetry friends during that time. And so we're really excited to be reading together and especially to be reading in Emily Dickinson's home. Um, and what we thought we would do is uh, read solo at the podium um, a little bit and then sit down and kind of trade poems back and forth as a way of sharing with you um, not only our work as individuals, but our work as it has evolved over the years as each other's first readers and close friends. Um, so I'd like to start off um, with a poem that will be in the book I'm working on now. The title of the book is My Tie, and that is also the title of this poem. My tie. Sometimes I imagine it a Windsor knot around my amniotic neck, the silky slick umbilical cord, sea blue with blood. But it wasn't like that inside her womb. There I behaved, wore my cord as a dress's accessory belt, its color matching the new blue of my eyes. No. That's a lie. Inside, I've had no gender, not even when, drunk on my mother's hormones, my body spotted pale pink blood. I took my first breath, some man's hand cut us apart, and the eye in my belly winked open and shut, letting me in on a secret I promptly forgot. She kept the shriveled knot in a drawer in her jewelry box, most prized proof of my tie to her and of what she thought became me. 
one of the things Ben and I have in common as poets is we are both queer poets and that identity inflects our work. We also both write frequently about our families of origin and how that shapes our relationships today. Um, this next poem I am going to read uh, illustrates for me that gender socialization starts very young. Um, baseball. When he told me I throw like a girl, I became at age five, a girl girl, or rather girl became me, her rose colored shame ribbon snaking from my emptied hand to cinch its bright bow at my neck. Yet I also became not a girl as the shouldered fury lacking in my girl pitch rose like a voice, like a new kind of weather inside girl me, its first cold drops puddling deep in my flat girl chest, unnoticed until it rose so high the river overran its banks and people started to call it other things besides girl, except they still called it girl. And when the baseball finally smashed the window, they said a hurricane did it, and the hurricane had the name of a girl. But by then, girl had been said so many times, it was just another background girl sound, like distant rain. I moved away from home and uh, went to San Francisco, as, as one does, um, and this next poem has the same title as the first poem I read, Mai Tai, um, but it's said many years later. Uh, in 2024, um, I know that my gender identity is non-binary, but there's a memory within this poem that goes back to a time when I was just really sort of not even grasping for a word because I didn't even know there was a word. Okay, Mai Tai. I smooth it down my shirt front between my breasts. That little hiss, a cat call almost, but one I make for myself, the drag and give of silk, the thrill of the display, like what a man I dated told me once. The reason for lipstick, he said, is to make a proxy cunt of the mouth since humans are the only animals to hide their genitals with clothes. He was putting on lipstick as he said this, becoming a woman as I watched from my perch on his bed. Now I walk down the street in my tie and things happen, not only to the swing of my shoulders, the lope of my hips. Women comment, the men look away. I don't know that ex-lover anymore. Can't ask him what I long to ask. If he ever wanted, when he was through using it, to unknot the silk of his cock and let someone else slip it on. This thing that was part of him, but not in the way we'd thought. The way the red of his mouth became the red of my mouth when we kissed hard enough. And the last poem I'll read up here at the podium before turning it over to Ben. Um, this happened just as written during my childhood. And I thought about it for years and years. And it took me a long time to figure out what the poem in it actually was. Um, and this is from my first book. Uh, no, it's from my second book, um, Mouth of Earth. A Story. On the street of my childhood, a boy kept a pet boa constrictor. The boa ate live mice, one per month. The boy left home and left his mother in charge of the feedings. The mother, unaware that the boa had just eaten, 
dropped a second mouse in the glass terrarium. The boa was already full and not interested. The mouse huddled in a corner, terrified. After several days, the mouse began to starve. No mouse food in the terrarium. The mother, unhappy in her role as procurer for a snake, kept as far away from the terrarium as possible and did not notice anything. Eventually, hunger grew stronger than terror and the mouse took a bite of the boa constrictor. I won't prolong this. The bite became infected and the boa died. Eventually, the mother noticed. When the son came back, he found the palatial glass cage inhabited by a single mouse. When I think about this story now, I think most often of all the life I've spent being the huddled mouse in such danger I felt, but not. It is harder to see I have also been the snake and the mother, too many times the mother. But today, when I thought of it, I was the boy staring in amazement at a life I would not have thought possible had I not been there to witness firsthand the blindness of the body and the persistence of the body and the circumstances of the body among others, the body that needs and needs and forgets absolutely nothing. So now I'll turn the podium over to Ben. Uh, with the poems that Julian just shared with us. Um, as Julian mentioned, uh, we're both queer poets who write about family um, and think about our formative years like the baseball poem we just heard. So I'm going to open with a poem which in some ways is um, kin to that one. This poem is called The Other Gay Kid in Class. Uh, I was having a conversation uh, with another poet, um, well, another writer, not a poet. And uh, 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 that writer told me that um, as a person of color, if there was another person of color in their class, that um, it actually felt less comfortable to be uh, like in conversation or to be friends with that person because it would make something louder. And when they said that it made years of my childhood flood back to me in a different way. Um, because I think, you know, knowing I was a gay kid, if there was another kid who maybe seemed queer, like I was afraid of that kid, that it would somehow implicate me. And this poem is um, about that idea. The other gay kid in class. One year, his name was Jay. He had slender fingers and hair I remember as natural platinum the wisps of it reaching past his shoulders. Another year, I forget his name. My mother shamed me by making me go to his party where I was one of three kids set up to play in a finished basement. He had a habit, that one, of touching others at school. And there in the corner admitted something unspeakable to me, or almost did because he broke off mid-sentence and ran upstairs crying. Minutes later, his mother came down to tell us it was time to go. And this, waiting on his porch for my dad's car, the rain in front of me, a pounding. I had asked to stay out there, to wait. The one in middle school, Homek, sat at a high table with three girls and they deftly sewed calico squares into a pillow. From my stool across the room, I couldn't follow their chatter. Every year we stood with great space between us like the few teeth of a jack-o'-lantern, the last ones picked from bombardment. 
who, in retrospect, can blame the team captains. One year, because it was the 1970s, he wore a knitted vest. One year, I walked the aisle of the bus, saw the green pebbled seat beside him was empty, and kept walking. That one went on in midlife to marry a man. We wended the years parallel, but he moved to San Francisco after graduation. Another ended up at Rutgers like I did, and I often saw him loitering by the Alexander bathrooms. We checked each other out as I went in. I heard he got AIDS. He heard I did. At the prom after party where I lost my virginity to a girl, he sat on a corner, on a couch in the corner, dateless. We locked eyes as I drank with a football team captain whose open tuxedo shirt showed his thick chest. Between shots, I glimpsed the eyes of one, the nipples of the other. Much later, he found me on Facebook. I didn't recognize him, that one, Jason. And soon after, someone posted that his profile would become a memorial page, testicular cancer. It was then I recalled how unevenly his shoulders sat, one side always weighed down by a book bag, and how ashamed I'd be when he called to me in the halls in his loud high sing-song. Most years he was effeminate and I could pass, so I avoided him. But that didn't explain why he avoided me. And one year, one year at summer camp, he was lanky, had braces and acne, and waited for me every day where the buses unloaded. We sat side by side on the swing set, kicking between us a stick that was dynamite, that when our countdown reached zero, would explode. That year, we ate at the same picnic bench, and a group of girls at the other end called over, so, are you guys gay? He made of his arm and pool towel a cloak and held it out in front of us. What we did behind it, I won't say, but he shut his eyes and they erupted the girls in giggling. My mother approves. It was not evening out jewelry, not twice a year jewelry. She slept in it. She always said when she died, I would have it, but almost certainly never pictured me wearing it. How it would lie an inch below my beard in the hollow between my clavicles. How the serpentine chain would catch stray hairs on my shoulders and neck and the emerald bright with its corona of diamond chips would fill the open collar of a flannel shirt over jeans, brown belt work boots and be to the right kind of man, a signal, a traffic light glowing green at the most vulnerable spot on my throat. Now in death, she understands the necklace was always about drawing the eye to the flesh, a way to scoop light from the air, to make a man want to catch that light like a snowflake on his tongue. Yes, that's the word she's saying to the body most like her own once was, briefly incarnating herself in front of me to straighten the chain. My mother, like any mother, willing her child to be beautiful. Yes, it fits like that, close to the throat. Um, and I'll just read uh, one more poem. This is also um, about my mother who, uh, who died in 2017. Um, I miss very much. Uh, let's see, this poem is about uh, a dream in which she came back to me. And my mother was a a tchotchke collector. So this poem is about her and her tchotchkes. It's called The Wedgwood, The Watches. <clears throat> Wedgwood didn't matter, she says, speaking to me in a dream. The little vases and ashtrays, 
the boxes littering the house, I ask? They didn't matter? No, she says. Swirling ice cubes in a tumbler of vodka. No, though haggling for them at yard sales, watching people wrap them in newspaper, then shoving them so wrapped into my purse, that mattered. She takes a drag on her cigarette like she used to at bingo when I was five, six, seven years old, and she sat across from me, smoking cigarette after cigarette to the drone of numbers in a hall so dense with smoke you couldn't make out blue hairs five seats away. What about the watches, I ask, knowing my mother's predilection for watches? A Hamilton, she'd cry, a Seiko, it still works. Winding its gear between the long nails of her thumb and forefinger and thrusting it right up against the side of my head so I could hear the tick. Watches, she says now, so ghostly in my dream that she flickers as hazy and insubstantial as cigarette smoke. Smoke, generating smoke, didn't mean shit, she says, slicing the air with the edge of her palm like she did when she was alive, her face, her jaw set firm. But showing you, showing dad the watch after I came home from the auction, holding it out and watching for the tick to register in your eyes, that, she says, then she mentions dad how he'd snatch the watch from her hand and hold it up high and say, it ticks, it ticks. She got a real bargain, a real Matsya, a Hamilton that ticks. Then he'd parade around the kitchen a little, do a kind of strut, and she would grab the watch back from his hand and strap it on her wrist and wear it for the rest of the day and say, I know, I know, as if there wasn't any irony in his pronouncement. And who knows, maybe there wasn't. That, she says, mattered. And now, because it's a dream, she grabs my wrist and zap. We're in the house where he still lives, watching him bend over a drawer with nine or ten Seikos and Hamiltons, with his forefinger stirring them around as if they were morsels of frying meat. He's speaking in a low voice. She liked watches, your mother. So I ask her, if the watches don't matter, but this matters, doesn't that mean the watches matter? She swirls her tumbler, and we look up from the kitchen counter at my dad, who continues explaining about the watches. But soon, all we hear is the ticking of out-of-sync gears. Tick, tick, tick. So um, uh, now we're going to do the, the part of the reading that Julian mentioned, which is uh, a kind of poem ping pong. Um, I'm going to read a poem, and then uh, uh, Julian will read one more response. So the post first poem I'm going to read is <clears throat> um, a poem about Emily Dickinson. This is from a short chat book I wrote uh, called An Elegy. Um, and it's a the collection is Elegies from My Dog. Um, and the form is somewhat introduced by Dickinson, but in this case, the subject matter is two. The poem ends with a quote from a letter that um, Emily Dickinson wrote to Higginson, who uh, was a, a literary man of his day and whom she wanted to be um, her mentor. And um, he refused her a number of times. And the poem ends with one of her final appeals to Higginson. Um, which which is part of the poem, so you'll hear it at the end. And it has a short epigraph, You Ask of My Companions. Hills and sundown are worth something, certainly, but the day-to-day -day of proffered food, putting to bed, or setting out side by side through a field, say, early morning, that becomes joyful because joy sparks between, among, and its core is movement. Well, the flare of verse, of course, is something too, but a midwife to glad waking, it wasn't, even, I'd wager, for a genius like her, much less lesser practitioners. Think of the time after. The house got awful quiet, the routines that shaped the day now gone, 
a bargain's aftermath, care exchanged for a sense of purpose and love, both also gone. Get dressed, come down to eat, all expressed it must have been in stillness, her footsteps on the stairs sounding one by one, white dress starched, button tight to the collarbone, and soon that note to Higginson. Carlo died. Will you instruct me now? As if anyone in a full house could understand her loss. When you were reading the poem about the watches, I was thinking that I wished I'd met your mother. Um, and I'm glad I got to meet the dog. <laughs> my, two of my dearest. Yeah, <laughs> Tam Tam was her name. Um, so in response, I'm also going to read a poem um, that was inspired by Dickinson. Um, I wrote this just a couple of months ago, um, a month ago, actually. Uh, I was in a workshop with the poet Claire Rossini, and she read a poem of Dickinson's um, that made me think about how one of the things I admire about Dickinson so much is how subversive she was um, toward the organized religion of her day in some ways. Um, and for a while, this poem that I'm about to read, uh, the working title was Much Gesture from the Pulpit, um, which is a line of Dickinson's. Um, but it's now called To the Haters. And it has an epigraph from the Smithsonian Magazine. This week, a particularly odd little bit of pseudoscience reared its head again. To the Haters. I concede the earth looks flat. The straight razor scrape where the sky slices the horizon is enough to keep you hating us fakes who say, we went over that edge in a barrel, baby. Not only lived to tell, but loved the splash of striking bottom. Come at us with bottles, break our hearts, capsize our blood like boats lost at sea. Show us your fear. We'll be it. Spare us the antediluvian at Noah's Ark rant, though. Go quietly your own straight way across the shore, poor raven, with no other port in the storm. Leave us our here be monsters, our undrowned unicorns. Um, so uh, in response, um, I'm also going to read a poem um, not to, uh, uh, about people who uh, are maybe on the opposite side of cultural issues. I'm trying to think of a, of a delicate, uh, a, a delicate formulation. That's as, as close as I got on the fly. Um, this poem is called "What Is Wrong with These People," um, and uh, um, the title is also. Uh, bleeds into the poem, so I'm going to reread the title uh, and go forward. What is wrong with these people, you ask? And this time, you're not being facetious. This time, you really want to know. If some mechanism within them has failed, a wire somewhere frayed away from its copper screw meant to secure it in place, like the socket of an old lamp, then all at once, you imagine how it might be done, how the head might be screwed off, how you could reach in to the threaded tube of the neck with your screwdriver and where the flathead screw would be. One, two, three twists to the right. It's not much of a leap from there to realize that they must be looking at you the same way, a similar kind of screwdriver in hand, though of course, Theirs is held handle in the fist downward as if it were an iceberg. Both of us have spent a fair amount of time working with tools and uh, 
fixing things in our homes. Um, it's a, it's a nice connection that we share. Um, and so I'm gonna respond to that one um, by reading another poem that has tool imagery in it. Um, and it's also in the tradition of subversive women. Fixing a lamp. I pull the old cord from the base. It's dangerous black cloth rotted from the wires because my mother says this brass desk lamp belonged to her great grandmother who kept it on the table beside the bed to which she was confined, her ancient bones breaking and re-breaking. At 85, she instructed my mother, age six, now, dearie, in the top drawer behind my underthings, you'll find some pliers. I need replacement parts and lack the words, have only round piece, curved piece thing. My mother offers me a yellowed manual from 1963. It's diagrams intricate as a body. I learn socket shell, harp holder, tube nut. I learn to tie the underwriter's knot, looping the new cord through itself as insurance against electrocution, fire. My six-year-old mother grew bigger, had two daughters, got divorced, used to put the kids to bed, then take a sledgehammer to a kitchen wall that no longer pleased her. Waking at night to the sound of demolition made me feel safe with possibility. The breaking down, then subsequent repairing of the world. In the morning, dust everywhere. No breakfast, light in a different place. Um, I'm gonna respond uh, to that poem, uh, to the aspect of language enabling um, what commerce with the world, that you needed the language and eventually you found that. This poem is about, um, among other things, um, needing language that doesn't exist. And the poem begins with a made up German word, uh, that's the title, which I will read. And uh, if you don't know what it means, uh, it's because I made it up, yeah, it's a German word. Uh, and the word is uh, Neuer Mann Zweites State Herzschmerz. Okay. I want a word for it. That moment on a... I bet it exists in German, and maybe also a particular word for the sadness it engenders, some kind of schmerz, preceded by a string of syllables which sound, as in the best German, like a combination of cursing and crooning. If there was a word like that, I would have said it to you over dinner before the waitress told me that she was wrong, that the soup I had now half consumed was not in fact vegetarian. I would have reached across, put my hand on the back of yours and said the word with you. I'm of a sentimental turn of mind that imagines such gestures make things easier. Now here's the part I want explained. What happens in that moment? What makes a thing fall away from itself? Like an object you expect to be heavy, that you're sure is heavy. So you end up lifting with too much jerk and almost tumble. What causes the weight to rise up out of it, leaving it a styrofoam model of itself? That's what I would ask with my hand on the back of yours, our bento boxes, half finished, the smell, feel of your beard still lingering on my lips, mourning not exactly the loss of you, after all, still sitting across from me, but simply the revelation of who we are, which isn't who we might have been together. Yeah. Uh who we are isn't who we might have been. Um, 
I'm going to respond to that one by reading a poem um, that I feel like is basically that relationship that you just described, um, uh, but it was in my life and the end of it. Um, and this next poem is set in San Francisco, where I lived for many years a long time ago. Um, and then I moved back east partly to because I needed to break up with the person who this poem is about. But we sort of had a lot of long distance phone calls after I moved back east. Um, and so this poem is called Long Distance. Don't hang up. Just leave the receiver dangling and climb out your window. Take yourself up the street, the steep one with stairs. Jump over the guardrail into the switching grasses and run, please, up Corona Peak, over the cracked dirt, go all the way up, climb. Fog salt and Mexican sage breathe your clothes like campfire smoke. Your body's a sail full of wind sharpened light flying off a Pacific you can taste in your teeth. Now here's what I want. Unfurl yourself beneath the sky blown sun. Lie down in the dry grass and catch fire. Let the wind Take the largest thing you'll ever have in this life. Let it kite away from you. Let it dive with your heart. Now take a breath and tell me about love. So um, I'm gonna to respond to that sense of communication difficulty and also just the, the, the image, which is really haunting for me of, um, lie down, let yourself catch fire. Um, and this poet is called Cricket in the House. Um, and it's also about um, communication or lack of it. Cricket in the House. Not the music, like a bicycle bell ringing faster as you pedal faster. Not the spring set contraption of its body, which I expected to be big as a mantis but could sit comfortably on a nickel. No, not in the half light, how it's trilling turns the room into a field at dusk in which someone set a couch, a coffee table, a wing back, and not transformations generally, sound making space, like the time I busted an eardrum and brought to the silence of my bedroom the shushing of a far off ocean. Not like that. And not how it got in or how long it would be until and why it would die. Just what do they eat and drink anyway? But the thought of music meant for others of its kind, now backed behind a couch on hardwoods, antiseptic and dry, a patina of dust, cobwebs at the legs, and cat hair tumbleweeds. And cat hair tumbleweeds as I cross the room and it feels silent, <clears throat> the cricket briefly, and how it must long for mud and coolness, for the dew night covers everything with, for all the other sounds insects make that I don't notice, but that it notices. How it must register dislocation, even isolation, and how none of this alters its quality of song. <clears throat> because we must make music even though we know we are going to die. Height. Each year, I lose a little more of it. The spaces between the vertebrae slowly sighing closed, like an accordion that after a full day of playing dances, lets out a long, atonal breath. The exhalation of every song it ever made as the musician prepares to lay the instrument gently in its box. Um, 
And I'm going to close for us with a, a short poem. It's a three-line poem called Language. And the poem is um, a simple simile. Language. A prophylactic that promises better sensitivity. I roll my eyes, rip the foil. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's been so fun sitting here with both of you. Your energy uh, together is contagious. There's a Dickinson poem that I always think of during these bus presences, which is, um, I'm going to quote part of it and hopefully get it right. Um, it's, nor would I be a poet. It's finer, own the ear, um, enamored, impotent, content, the license to revere. So I get to listen. Um, and now I get to ask questions of, um, from the audience and, and from the museum. So if, if you audience members have a question you'd like to ask of these poets, please do put it in the chat. Um, I appreciate you uh, kicking off the poem Ping Pong, as it were, with a Dickinson poem. And I'd like to know a little bit more about each of your relationships with Dickinson or their ways that you see yourself in conversation with her as maybe as queer poets, American poets, poets who live in this part of the world. Uh, I can start. Um, so I touched on this a little bit, introducing my Dickinson poem. Um, but I think that when I was growing up and in high school and college even, um, I was not an English major. And if I knew anything about Dickinson, I just sort of had this idea that like the Belle of Amherst, like she was, and Belle makes me kind of think like Southern Belle. And um, I don't know, I sort of had this idea that like her poetry was sort of frothy. And I mean, it's really anything but. And when I finally got to know her work, one of the things that just knocked me back was she is so subversive. Um, uh, and, you know, under so much pressure to just fall in line with the church of her day. Um, and she writes things like, uh, okay, I'm going to try to get this right, much gesture from the pulpit, strong hallelujahs roll, narcotics cannot still the truth that nibbles at the soul. Like, wow. Um, so I think... I mean, I'm inspired just by the fact that she's a genius, right? But I think also because she stayed so true to her own voice and kind of taught the rest of the world how to read the kind of poetry that she was writing. And that's so powerful and inspiring in any, any moment in history, but especially for her moment in history. Um, and, you know, when we sit down to like do our own little thing in comparison, you know, not in comparison with the greats, but like under the long shadow of the greats, like we're all trying to find our own voice um, and, and write something memorable. And so, you know, there are a handful of poets and she is one that just shine a light on, on what's possible. and. It's it's nice to be able to bask in it. Yeah, it is nice to be able to bask in it. I, you know, when, when I uh, was in grad school and I, I began a, a sort of a serious study of American poetry under various teachers, Whitman and Dickinson were really set, set up as as um, parents, um, you know, for American poetry. And because Whitman is a, a gay man, and because um, he uses free verse with a strong conversational charge. He was the figure that, you know, I felt immediate connection with. So it really wasn't until, you know, and but Dickinson was 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 there in my head. The poems are wonderful. I just didn't know how to use them, especially because her music is so characteristic that, you know, you, you can't write like if if you there's very hard to to learn from Dickinson's music without being a cheap copy of Dickinson. 
Um, but when I actually um, uh, wrote a, a, a collection of elegies, a short collection, um, grief slowed my poetic process down. So, you know, like, like I've always sort of sort of a poet of, of Whitman, which is to say that, you know, I have a ton to say and 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 the poems come out um often badly, but never slowly. But but grief, once it slowed me down, I was able to um to, to sort of think about, you know, the, the really intricate, marvelous formulation, right? Truth must dazzle gradually, you know, the sort of mimetic power of dazzle gradually. You can't say that mm -hmm. fast. Um, that, that slowing down in that way, um, uh, you know, like enabled that poetic project. And, you know, there's also the, the that poetic project is full of um, slant rhyme and um, has a syllabic count. And it also has that the only poet mentioned in it is that poem to Dickinson. So I guess I would say that, um, you know, that what, 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 when I found the project that fit, like, sh you know, Dickinson being there made it possible. You know, it finally let me kind of um, use the admiration that I, I carried since grad school. Yeah, those words, Carlo died. You ah. struck me now. That just means oh, me. awful. It's, <laughs> it's just right. The heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's uh, not necessarily a poem, but her letters have that thrust of the poetic. Maybe it is. Well, I mean, just just to, just for people who are watching. So you know, it's 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 a letter that can. It's just that the the set the set the whole letter is Carlo died. Will you instruct? There's no other text around it. It's mm -hmm. it's the, the emptiness punctuates it. It just yeah. It's so immediate. It's, so immediate. She always assumes you know what she means, mm -hmm. um, which makes you feel so intimately connected. Um, so I'm getting some questions uh, from the audience, and I might tie a few of them into some of my own. So um, Sandy is wondering what your current um, inspiration is right now, which would be uh, a fun to answer. And I also, this may or may not be your current inspiration, so you can throw it away. But I remember talking to both of you that you you told me that you were in sort of an unofficial queer book club together, which sounds really fun. And I want to know if you have any recommendations for us. Might be inspired. Yeah. <laughs> so we, um, I think last winter, we read Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. And then this spring, we read The Hours by Michael Cunningham, which is a book that's sort of like Mrs. Dalloway run through a kaleidoscope. Um, and both beautiful, so memorable um, work. So yeah, I would definitely recommend that. And we were just talking earlier, we were getting coffee before coming back here um, about a book, um, by another Connecticut poet, um, well, we're both from Connecticut, uh, Gabrielle Calvin Caressi, um, who is also a queer poet who wrote a wonderful first collection called The Last Time I Saw Amelia Earhart. Um, and then was saying, oh yeah, I'll read that and then we can talk about it. Um, <laughs> so great. if you all read that, then we can all talk about it. Uh, but it's a, it's a terrific book um, that engages with place and a lot of 20th century history. Um, as well as the, as the poet's own life uh, in a really interesting way. So we we have we read a number. We, we read the uh, the Price of Salt and Anna Karenina, which which thank God we did because there's no other way that I, I don't I don't know. Like I thought if somebody had tied me down with a gun to my head, <laughs> it's a long book, it. right? It's long, but only the first nine hundred pages have been added. I've never read it, so <laughs> now I know what it means. No, it's really it's wonderful. Actually, <laughs> I, but but I was going to say that the two books that we have read that have blown the top of my head off. One um is is uh, um is is Isherwood. Uh, Oh, the Berlin story. The Berlin stories, which 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 is so good, mm -hmm. and and the other one was um, was the Virginia Woolf, mm -hmm. um, Mrs. Dalloway. Um, so there's some there's some 
yeah i don't but but how, do we do we take the inspiration part um i mean i just say for myself Maybe your current inspiration is something I, completely different I, well i'll just say i, I i'm i'm doing um a, a, a proofs of a prose book at the moment and it's just it just there's no inspiration to be like so i just say it is pure it is pure treachery so up. they shut you up in prose <laughs> so that's, that's right it's, so okay. this one to you. um all right so i think my so there's two poems I read, Mai Tai, The Umbilical Cord, and Mai Tai, The Masculine Neckwear. Um, the, the, the book that I, my third poetry collection is going to be called Mai Tai, if all goes well. And it's kind of about the tension between um, what is expected of you and what you turn out to be. And I'm 56. And, you know, when I was like at the age where people often discover their sexuality and their gender identity, like non-binary wasn't a word. So, you know, it, I came to it much later. Um, and I think one of the things that really inspires me now is watching um, millennials and Gen Zers um, play with language and explore their own lives um, in the poetry classes that I teach. And I take a lot of inspiration from my students and their lives and and the, their freshness um, of, of their work. It's, it's a great thing to have friends of a generation older than me and to be in regular contact and also to have friends a generation younger than me um, and to really kind of have that generational connection. And it's not only older people handing things down, it's also younger people handing things up. I love that. I even feel that too, even though I'm, you know, I guess I'm a millennial, but um, I feel like, especially with younger queer people, I feel like I learn a lot from them and yeah. your time moves differently and every generation feels like a couple micro generations. <laughs> so um, I, I'm getting some questions about your process. Um, Victoria wants to know, do you set aside a certain time of day to write or is your poetry writing time more random and spontaneous? I want to take that well, I, I, I will. So the, the luxury of, um, and, and there are drawbacks too, but the luxury of, of living uh, alone or with a cat until relatively recently is that you can, it can be random and spontaneous. Um, so for me, it really is, um, catch as catch can, but but because I don't have dependence, um, that can be often. You know? It depends on the time of year. Um, mm -hmm. If I'm teaching uh, and I have a spouse, Ivy, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and we have a daughter and we have some cats and uh, there's a lot going on, um, then it is very much kind of like back of the envelope. Um, if it's the summer like it is now, I am really trying to get a lot done. And so my goal, which I'm not totally meeting, is to write three hours a day in the mornings, which is a lot of writing for me. Um, but there, I said it, it's on the internet now, so I have to do it. Um, so yeah, it, it depends. But the ideal, I think, is always for me anyway to have a set time. So, so um, to, June, you, you've written a number of novels. Do you think for the novel? Do you need us the time for a novel? Yes, more so than poetry. And actually, I wrote my first, a lot of the poems from my first book um, got written after I had a baby. And then there's like no time at all. But I mean, you can write a draft of a poem in 15 minutes. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it takes weeks or months, whatever. But you can't write a novel. I mean, you can't even write a scene of a novel in 15 minutes. And I think for a novel, yeah, you really do need much more, or I need anyway, much more of a block of uninterrupted time because otherwise like I can't even remember what was happening and it takes 45 minutes to remember like what the point of the chapter was and then your writing time is over. So, yeah. Do, do you find that in, you've written a novel too. Well, I, um, you, you know, part of the reason I ask is, is, is I'm just thinking of, of, of the mental space. Like, like I think when you write a poem, I mean, it can be more directly biographical. I suppose a novel can too. But 
I wrote just just the one, um, and uh, I'm trying to quit. And and I I think you need to sort of be in that world in a way that you you know what I mean. Like you need to actually you need that consistent practice because you need to be living in a different world. You know. Yeah. So it takes time to sort of I don't know like like I guess immersion in a way like a poem you can be immersed in it for an hour, but a novel I think you need to be immersed for maybe I don't know maybe it just takes longer to get up to the immersion or something well you know just to build on this one of the things we learned on the tour of the Emily Dickinson house or maybe you already knew this um is that basically like she wrote a poem a day for four or five years like she wrote like 1200 poems in five years or something and like it's like she got on a roll and then she just stayed there and and, you know, thinking, like having this idea, you know, that we get in our heads of like, like Dickinson is the recluse, but in fact, she lived in a house with other people. And the fact that she got that space and then held on to it, um, it's just remarkable. I mean, in a way, now that you say that, it, it, it is like what I was trying to su suggest about novel process, right? Like she lived in that world and stayed in it in the way you need to, to write a novel, but just the poems just kept coming. Yeah, and like and once you sort of like get wherever poems right. come from, like onto the beam of like, okay, we're just gonna like tune into this channel constantly, like you will get more ideas. All the possibilities yeah, stay there. Yeah. yeah, exactly, right, right, right. Dwell, <laughs> not just like visit, visit for fifteen minutes. Right. Yeah. Dwell, yeah, yeah. slow down, unpack. Right. <laughs> well, it is actually so quickly um, mm. that time for us to uh, to wrap up our our conversation um, today. But thank you so much. It's been so much fun. Mm. Um, thank you all to this evening poets uh, Julian Strong and Ben Grossberg. We hope um, you'll go, all of you will go online to learn more about these poets and their work. And while you are there, be sure to head up to the Emily Dickinson Museum website to see the rest of the series lineup. We have a great lineup for you. Um, we will be stream streaming these events live on the third Thursday monthly through October. So there's some more to see. And we hope you'll join us again. If you would like to make a donation to the museum in support of free programs like this one, you can do so at www.emilydickinsonmuseum.org. And we couldn't do it without you. Thank you all and have a good night. Thank you Thank for you. having us. It's been so much fun.